Continuing with our Python discussion, we're going to get into some of the fundamentals that you'll need to know, regardless of what programming language you might want to work with. These fundamental concepts are pretty much going to be the same throughout any programming language. Let's start off and talk a little bit about numbers. Now, when we represent numbers in a programming language, there are a couple of things we have to think about. There are fundamentally two kinds of numbers that we work with most of the time. Some languages have more definitions than this, but to keep things simple here, we'll just talk about two types of numbers that will either be integers, what you might also call a whole number, or a floating point number, which is, of course is something with a fraction, some decimal point, and then some numbers. So two different types of numbers, ints and floats. And then when we're working with the numbers, we're following this traditional arithmetic concepts of how your operators work, addition, subtraction, order of operations is of course important. That same thing applies uh, for evaluation of a statement in a programming language as it does when you're solving a problem using math or algebra. Also remember that anytime you divide a number, even if they're integers when you start, the result will be a, a float. It will always convert it to a float. And there are a few other operations that do that as well, but if either of the numbers is a float, then the result will definitely be a floating point number. Otherwise it will typically be an integer. One of the first things we'll get our hands onto is working with the print function. So we can use the print function to display output onto the monitor. So we can display a number. If n was a number, as in the example here, we can print a number uh, and it'll display that on the monitor. We can print solutions to arithmetic problems simply by including the numbers within the parentheses. So the format of the print function requires that you have an open parenthesis and a closed parenthesis around your arguments to the actual function. So the example here, print 3 plus 2 comma and then 3 minus 2 comma and then a third argument 3 times 2. Each of the commas is a separator and so those values get interpreted and executed um, distinctly and individually. So obviously the 3 plus 2 is 5 and then you have 1 and then 6. And you can see the result down there at the bottom. The next concept we're going to cover is what we call variables. I like to think of variables in one respect as almost like a, a bucket. If somebody gives you a bucket that you can put things into, what you put in there could be almost a lot of things. I mean it could be variable, hence the word variable. So you could put stones in it, or you could put water in it, or you could put Lego blocks in it. Lots of things could go into it. And so what you might put as a label on the bucket to give you some indication of what's inside the bucket would be the names of the variable that we call. So in this particular example here, we have a typical uh, mathematical definition of a program that calculates the distance based on speed and time. So when you create these variables, for instance, speed or time elapsed, you want to make sure that you give them names that are representative of what is being held in them. So this time we're going to say, you know, speed is equal to 50, the time elapsed is equal to 14, and then a calculation. A third variable is introduced called distance, and we're setting it equal to the value that's held in speed times the value that's held in times time elapsed. And then we do a, a output statement. We print the result then, or the value that's held in distance. So the thing that you need to think about here is that the way that the assignments are being done, and we'll cover this a little bit more later, uh, 
we have a tendency to read from left to right in the English language. And in programming, you have to remember that evaluations are typically done and assignments are made from right to left. So it would technically be more correct to look at this and say the value of 50 is being assigned to the variable speed. The value of 14 is being assigned, assigned to the variable of time elapsed. And the third one, the value being held in time elapsed times the value held in speed is being assigned to the variable of distance. <coughs> Small distinction, but it, it's important that you realize that that's how it works. So here we go. This is what I was talking about as far as assignment statements. The expression is always evaluated on the right, and whatever the result is, is what gets assigned into the variable. So how do you name variables in Python and what are some of the restrictions? Well, generally speaking, you should begin them with a letter or possibly an underscore. Uh, they can only have values of letter, not values, but be named with letters and numbers and underscore. So no special characters other than the underscore. As I mentioned, it's always a good idea to label your bucket with what's inside of it. Make your variable names descriptive. If you use um, generic, not very descriptive ones, it gets to be hard to figure out what's going on with your program uh, later when you come back and try and figure it out a month down the road. So there's a convention that's typically used in naming variables. It goes by the word of a camel case camel, as in the animal with the hump on the back. So we start the name out with lowercase, and then we use an uppercase for a, at the beginning of each additional word in the name. So the example they show here is rate of change. So we started off with a lowercase r, but on the second words we always uh, capitalize the first letter. And this is called camel case. Keep in mind, too, that uh, we're dealing with case sensitivity when we're dealing with programming languages. So cat, as a variable spelled with a capital C, is not going to have the same thing as cat spelled with all lowercase. And there are also certain reserved words in any programming language that you may not use for your names of your variables. This is a listing here of some 33 different reserved words within Python that you may not use. So for instance, you may not set up a variable called try. Most of these are not ones you'll bump into, but it's possible occasionally. Just be aware that there are reserved words. All right, let's talk about mathematical functions for a little bit. Because computers being what they are, they will run calculations very quickly and very easily. A lot of programs, in fact, are written specifically to do intense calculations. So it's not surprising that there are the usual mathematical functions available to you, as well as some exotic things if you so choose to import those libraries into your Python modules. Here we have a function called ABS, which is, if you'll remember from some of your earlier math things, this is an absolute value. So we're calculating the absolute value of a, of a particular number. Another place you might have bumped into these kind of things before is in spreadsheets. If you have any experience in doing spreadsheets, you'll be more familiar with some of these kind of things. So here's a calculation that does absolute value of a couple of different numbers. And of course, absolute values are always positive. The integer function takes a number and converts it to an integer. If it's already an integer, as in the example here of 3, obviously the value is going to be the same. Notice that the rounding is not being done on this. It's strictly taking the integer value, the first value, and a, that becomes the result. So if we were trying to round up 2.7, it would typically round up to 3. But in this case, 
regardless of whether it's positive or negative. It doesn't matter. It, uh, it's only taking the integer place value. There is, of course, a function to do the rounding. It's called round, and it functions just like the examples show. Put your argument within the parentheses, and the result of that uh, function or evaluation will be the rounded number. Notice that you have the option down here of uh, a second argument to the function, which would tell how many decimal points you wanted to round to. This would be useful in doing scientific type applications. So here's some examples. A program that evaluates some functions and prints the results. So let's look at these real quick. We say I can set the value of 2 and assign it into the variable of a. We assign the value of 3 into the variable of b. We then run a print statement within the open parentheses here. We have a function that calculates the absolute value of all of this in here. So these are where you need to do your traditional order of operations. So we would do the, math, uh, the multiplication first. 4 times b, the value held in b is 3, so that's going to be 12. And then 1 minus 12 is going to be a negative 11. But since we're taking the absolute value of that, then the result will be the positive value of 11. And you can see from the remaining examples, I don't need to take the time to go through all of these, but follow the typical order of operations when you're doing these kinds of things. A divided by B, we want to round it to three decimal points. Let's add a little bit more complexity to the scenario here. What we call augmented assignments. I mean, this is so common that we really don't call it augmented assignments. We just use these uh, consistently and all the time. These are just normal expressions that we use as we're doing the programming. So remember that we always evaluate from the right side and assign the results to the left. So in this particular case, the variable called var, start over here, we're going to take whatever value is in var, we're going to add 1 to it, and we're going to assign the results of this operation over to the left to var. So var will take on a new value from what it had before. In this case, it's going to be incremented by 1. Python has a shorthand notation for this. A lot of programming languages do have shorthand notation. They're not always the same. Uh, but with Python, we can shorten this entire thing up to var plus equal 1. So that's a shorthand notation. Anytime you see this, look at the operation that's being done and know that you're simply, in this case, incrementing a value by 1. In this value over here could be anything. It could be 22. Here's some examples of different uh, shorthand notations. This is a straight assignment operation. Take the value of 6, put it into the variable num1. This is an increment by 1, so the value in here if it started out as 6 here, when this gets completed, the value is going to be 7 because it will have taken the original value of 6 and added 1 to it. Here is the same thing except with a minus sign. This would be what we would call a decrement operation. We're decrementing the value in num2 by 5. So if num2 is equal to, set equal to 7 and we decrement it, by 5, it's going to have the value of 2 in it when we're completed and done. Same thing with division. Multiplication or even exponents. So asterisk asterisk or star star is an exponent notation within Python. A couple of other operators that we can use are the slash slash, which is a division, and also a modulus operator. So these are some specialized operators that aren't used too often. But it's just good to know that some of these things are 
available in the think of the when you need something like that you typically might have to go and look it up in the reference manual so here's an example of that convert 41 inches to 3 feet and 5 inches so if we take our initial value of 41 and assign it to a new variable called total inches we then take total inches use the integer division divide it by 12 and assign that result into feet we'll get this value up here then we have to take the mod the operator the modulus operator to get the remainder of the number of inches and that would then give us the feet and the inches as I mentioned your standard traditional mathematical order of precedence applies when we're doing operations in Python syntax errors are something you will become intimately familiar with as you're learning a language we tend to create a lot of syntax errors because we don't have the the language memorized in exactly the order in which things ought to be uh, placed down so typically you get three kinds of syntax errors this example here has an extraneous parenthesis on the end so you're going to get some error a syntax error for that here's an example of using a reserved word trying to assign a variable a value and you're thinking you're going to be able to use this as a uh, variable but you can't because it's a reserved word that will also give you a syntax error and using commas where you're supposed to have colons or semicolons where you're supposed to have commas or different things like that will also generate syntax errors this is what kind of a message box you'll typically get and then the other kind of error you get is when you're actually running a program these you don't figure out until your program has been compiled or not compiled but created and and you run it and then the runtime errors will come up here's an example of a misspelling here's an example of trying to use the value of X when it's not been created yet Python is a little bit looser than a lot of languages in the sense that you don't have to de specifically define your variables to begin with but you will run into problems if you don't if you try to use them in certain operations before they actually have a, va a value inside them and there's a division by error or by zero kind of an error the thing about runtime errors is that they terminate the execution of the program in other words they just stop and abort right where they occur so you'll typically get this kind of a message back when your program has an abnormal ending or ab end as we often say in programming it'll tell you what line in your code created the error and a lot of times it'll tell you specifically the function and what error was caused by that function or by that incorrect syntax sometimes we get a logic error logic error well basically any saying that if it you, it's nothing syntactically wrong for instance it might be correct but the logic could be wrong so here's an example of an order of operations scenario where we didn't put any parentheses around the actual part that we wanted evaluated first and these can be hard to pick out because a lot of times you'll get an execution this will actually evaluate but not to the number that you were anticipating so let's talk about how things get stored in memory here a little bit so if we have this code n is equal to well, the value of 5 being assigned to n and the value of 7 being assigned to n here's what actually happens after the first statement is executed the value that's in there is 5 
and after the second statement is executed, that value of 5 is completely replaced by the 7. So anything, and just the, the point here is that as you move down and create new operations on a, vari on a variable, the old values go away and are replaced by new values. And that concludes this section of chapter 13, I believe it is, in our book.